Hello, everyone. Welcome to Timeless Voyager, where the knowledge is timeless and you are the Voyager. I am your host, Bruce Stephen Holmes. So strap your cosmic seatbelts on and prepare for some possible turbulence. My next guest, Livius Stanisaw, live today from the United Kingdom, started experimenting with crystals since he was a teenager. Turned into a hobby for many years, which made him sensitive to human and crystal energy. Now, later in life, Livia started to take a broader interest in alternative medicine, becoming interested in Reiki and crystal therapy. He received his first Reiki attunement in traditional Reiki two years ago, quickly followed by many other attunements and empowerments. Finally, he began combining healing modalities such as Reiki, crystal therapy, angel therapy, sound therapy, and frequency therapy as part of his alternative medicine practice. Now today we're going to discuss Reiki, crystal therapy, angel therapy, frequency therapy, their connections, and finally, Livio will discuss his conclusions. So, without further ado, welcome to the show, Livio. Thank you very much, Bruce. I'm happy to be here. Great to have you. Uh, we, the last time we did a show, it was all about frequencies, I believe. And so I think today we're going to broaden that out a little bit. So today we will um, talk about my views on energy medicine. And I'm using this term in the largest uh, possible uh, sense because um, all the modalities that I will uh, talk about can be um, viewed as such. And uh, as you mentioned, we'll talk about Reiki first, then we'll go and talk a little bit about crystals, then we'll talk about angels, uh, and a bit about, about frequency therapy, and then the combinations and connections between them. I will start by telling you a few things about myself, and then we'll uh, go and discuss uh, each separate point. I was born and raised in Romania, and I graduated there from medical school. And after that, um, I did research in cognitive neuroscience in Amsterdam, where I successfully defended my PhD thesis and got my uh, thesis done there. And um, after that, I specialized in nuclear medicine. Now, apart from my uh, career in medicine, I also was interested in things that uh, I found that were classified as alternative medicine. Um, and lately, I have been getting qualifications and or diplomas in fields such as uh, crystal therapy, Reiki, angel therapy, sound medicine, and frequency therapy. And this is also something that I wanted to make clear. Today I'm here as an alternative medicine practitioner. Uh, although I am a doctor, I will uh, use the angle of an alternative medicine practitioner. And just to briefly go through things that I have done is I've compiled a list of things that I've done because, I mean, the numbers don't matter, but what matters is that I, I've had a keen interest in this uh, fields of alternative medicine and more healing. And I've been learning about uh, the things that I will go through today uh, in depth. Um, interestingly enough, uh, people have made courses in these fields and each of them, uh, as you can see, is it, is an equivalent of 150 continual professional development points, which is quite something that's usually used in other fields that are more uh, down to earth. But um, it's very encouraging to see that alternative medicine is uh, 
taken as seriously as the other fields, and I'm very happy to witness that. Um, I also made a list of uh, Reiki attunements, and I will uh, explain what a Reiki attunement is. Just to say that um, I've taken the time to study this and, and practice this, and uh, I, I went as far as I could because attunement is something that helps a Reiki practitioner. And uh, it's not not about the number, but it's I think each of the systems of Reiki that you go into uh, adds a different flavor, if you like, to your practice. And although this was not one of my initial interests, uh, I I did get to acquaint myself very well with Reiki. First of all, let's see what, what is Reiki, because many people might not know that. Uh, Reiki is a Japanese energy healing technique, which is used for stress reduction and relaxation, which in turn promotes, in turn promotes healing. Uh, Reiki, as a name, is a combination of two words. A rei in Japanese means wisdom or higher power, and ki means universal life force. And then Reiki means spiritually guided life force energy. And that actually explain what, uh, explains what happens during a session. Uh, during a uh, session, the life force energy is channeled through the practitioner and to or towards the recipient. And it's good to know that these sessions can be direct, one-to-one, -one, uh, also, uh, the term laying of hands can be used, but they, are, they can also be done at a distance, and this has become uh, more and more popular in the last years for reasons that we, I think, many of us know. Now, Reiki was founded by Mikao Usui, uh, who was a, a Japanese Buddhist, and this happened about uh, 100 years ago. And then it was also brought to the United States by one of his followers uh, before the Second World War. And uh, that explains why it, uh, it's a very popular technique uh, in the Western countries, although it didn't originate there. What does Reiki do? Reiki uses the life force energy in order to balance many issues. I think, actually, in principle, any issue can be addressed with Reiki. And uh, they say that the, this energy is intelligent, and therefore it's not necessary to direct it in a very specific way. It's my belief, actually, that the, the less you try to control the energy, the better, because um, very often it uh, may do what you wish to be done in a better way than you would imagine. I think what you're saying then is that um, it's better to let it flow in its own direction than to actually direct it. Is, is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, uh, this is a matter of opinion, of course, and I'm sure that people can have a debate about this. But the way I see it is um, because the practitioner is a channel for Reiki energy, um, you already work with it by channeling it. And then uh, the way I use it is uh, knowing the issue or issues that uh, need, need work, um, I set the general intention that the energy will work with these issues and then I just let it flow through me. And I, that's right, I don't try to uh, direct it or control it much because I think that's what what's happened with the traditional Osui um, Reiki techniques. You would have to really lay your hands in specific points uh, in, a, in a specific succession. And while that ensures a very intense experience, um, it may not be necessary or or always help because, I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't imagine you need to do all those poses 
when you only need to address one issue. So when a person um, is being, I don't know, what's the right word, worked on or, or receiving, receiving the energy, um, you are in a sense, okay, I, I should make it a question. Are you involved in the process or is the process happening without you? And I don't even know how to describe who you is <laughs> at this point. Yeah, I was about to ask, do you mean the practitioner or the recipient? Um, okay, so the recipient is innocently, I, I assume, innocently receiving. Lying down, yeah, seated or lying down. So the practitioner uh, is, a, is this would be the word, a word I would use, allowing the information to come through as opposed to assisting it or directing it now, you can correct me if you want to i'm just trying to give you an idea oh no, that's i mean that's how i think of it because as i was saying it's you are a channel of the uh, of the reiki energy that's what the practitioner does and if you allow the flow of energy through you and then it goes to the recipient uh you're already yeah basically doing what what you need to do um you can place your hands on different spots and there are quite many techniques you can do for instance scanning with breaky to find places where the energy is not flowing as it should and so on and so forth but by channeling the energy i think you already need to do whatever you're doing and um, I mean, you, we only talk about these things on a one-on-one -on -one session, but if you do a remote or distance session, then there's no way for you to place your hands anywhere because the recipient is not with you physically. So that's, that's an interesting point. Um, you use the term scanning. Is that, would that be similar to, let's say, biofeedback? Oh, no, not at all. Uh, scanning, um, a scanning in Reiki uh, is called a biosan scan, and it's a technique where you just scan, the, the practitioner scans with their hands, or hands, depending on preference, the energetic body of the patient. You're not even touching the body, and you're just scanning. And asking for guidance, you would feel where you get to a place where the energy is not balanced. So if you're using, if you are not using, if you are doing, let's say, a remote view, for example, would you say that the person uh, who's receiving it is also, in a sense, assisting you by telling you what they're feeling, or, or, or do you ask them? I don't know. I, I, I don't know exactly how it works. Well, at least, I mean, that's not my experience. Maybe some people do that. Maybe they do a, a, an online session or a, by phone. It's possible. But the way I, I know how to do it is I just sit and do the session. And if it's the difference between the remote and the distance, I also have one of the slides ex explaining that. But Remote means uh, we're doing the session together. We schedule it, for instance, today at five o'clock, we'll do the session. Then at five o'clock, the recipient lies down in bed or sits in a relaxed position. Then the practitioner starts the session as if they would be together. <laughs> That's the same procedure as for an attunement, actually. I mean, it's not the same procedure, but the same way of doing it. And the distance session is, there's no time constraint. Uh, the practitioner does his session when he has the time for it, and the recipient will receive the energy when they're prepared for it. So what I'm getting at is, uh, and we're talking basically about the, the difference between a hands-on experience and a remote experience. Yeah. So, um, so in the uh, hands-on experience, well, let me start by asking this question. Uh, do you have a preference? Um, I don't really have a preference because each case is different. And uh, to tell you the truth, the first sessions that I did were distance sessions because mm -hmm. when I got my attunement was the lockdown period, so you couldn't really 
meet people face to face. And I just advertised for free sessions and I got volunteers. So I just went ahead and did it. And I mean, in the time of Mikawa Sui, this would have, would have been seen as impossible. But uh, yeah, this is a sign of yeah changing the times and we changing with the times. And I, I have to say, I got some very positive feedback. For instance, I, I had someone that I worked with was in Australia, and she was very happy with the results. So that's a that's a good point. Let's let's talk about. Do you have an example of someone have, who has a problem that you uh, work with them on, and then what their success was? I mean, yes, of course. I've had several people that I've worked with, and that felt the the beneficial effects of the session. And um, I can give three examples. I've had this lady that I mentioned, who uh, I only did one session, and then I had a repeat session. Uh, and uh, this was very beneficial for my confidence as well, because it was just in the beginning when I was, as I was mentioning, I advertised for some uh, free sessions because I, I didn't have anyone to practice with. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was very um, accurate in describing to me what the issues were, because I, I did, I mean, Maybe, uh, yeah, I, I, I scanned her, but mentally, let's say, not, I couldn't have done it physically anyway, but um, I, I, I just by visualization and intention, I looked at her energy body and then I imagined I was scanning with my hand on her body and I found a few places that I, I really felt there was something there. And I told her, you know, I, I felt this, this, and this. Mm. And she said, yeah, these are all issue places that are known to me. And I was, well, I, I mean, I, I, I have to say, not, not so much amazed, but I was very pleasantly surprised. And it increased my confidence a lot just by seeing because, yeah, there was no way for me to have known before I didn't even know her. Right. So, and that's a good, that's a good example because it shows that from your point of view, you're also innocent. It's not like yeah, you're, you're not contriving something. Well, I think this is important to people that are learning about it because uh, when they don't know really what it is or what it's about, all of these kinds of questions come up. And that was a beautiful example of the fact that when you did it, you also were surprised. <laughs> Yes, I, I was surprised. I, I didn't expect it, all of them to be, you know, hits and true. Um, and I've had results with other people as well, of course. Uh, I've had a lady that uh, she, she first came to see me at my practice with a one-on-one -on -one session uh, because uh, she knew about energy medicine and she's, she's very open spiritually, but she wanted to... Um, well, to have a feel of how things go, and I don't think she ever had a distance session before. Uh, but uh, she was happy with the first session, and then we rescheduled with distance sessions. So I, I did a few for her e each month, I think it was, and she was happy with the results. And um, she had some skin trouble that were significantly improved by her own saying, I haven't seen her after the session, but um, it, I mean, it's always good to have positive feedback. And then there's another person that I would use as an example. Uh, she had no experience with energy medicine whatsoever. She didn't even know what Reiki was. And I did a session um, of, I mean, I always combine things. So for me, it's always uh, Reiki with crystals at least. And I'll, I'll um, as I, I'm, I'll mention in my presentation, I combined several modalities, but uh, she felt a lot of things during the session. She felt when I was doing things, when she felt the Reiki flow and quite a few points uh, with things that I did energetically, which was, again, surprising for both of us. I didn't expect her to be so sensitive to energy, and she obviously didn't expect any of what happened. But she was happy with the results. 
<laughs> well, we don't want to hear any. We don't want to hear any experiences where the person wasn't happy. I mean, unless that's just not. I, no, I, I, I haven't had anyone that had that. Uh, they felt ill or or bad things happened to them after the session. I just had some people that said that they didn't feel anything, and there are reasons for that. But maybe we can discuss that uh, a little bit later. So when you do uh, Reiki, which is what we were basically using as the uh, the title of our uh, program, there are other um, modalities that you either include in that or are separate from that. What, how, how would you like to talk about those? Yes, I combine modalities, and I'll um, I'll get onto those points because um, for practical reasons, we need to split them up into different modalities and tell a bit about every of them. But then uh, you can obviously combine them. And that's a beautiful thing about these different modalities. You can combine uh, different ways of doing energy medicine. And I think the effects are even better when, because they complement each other. So before we start that, do you feel that there's anything else you'd like to say about Reiki? I, 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 oh, I have a few more things that I'd like to say about Reiki. Uh, I'll just sure. resume my presentation if that's all right. Yeah, please. Okay, so as I was saying, um, the Reiki, because of its nature, it can address uh, issues at any level. It can be a physical issue, emotional, mental, or spiritual. And that's because it's just so easy to use. You just set the intention of the energy working with the issue. And then you you let it do its thing. Um, an important point is that it will usually address the root cause of an issue, and that's why the effects may vary from one case to another, from one issue to another. Because, as you can imagine, uh, one person's headache, for instance, has a different cause than another person's headache. And also, it's possible that in the beginning, just after the session, in the um, following day or two, uh, the symptoms are exacerbated on the person gets other symptoms, and this is known as a healing crisis. This is important because although you might first um, interpret this as ne a negative effect, it's it's the prelude of the positive things which will happen because the energy is balancing. And that's why the end result is always beneficial for the recipient and works for the highest good. And uh, even though um, this is what we are, because people usually come to say, I have this issue, I'd like to have it fixed. But that's not always how things work because the the root cause of an issue can be something completely different than the, the issue altogether. So that's good to keep in mind. Can you um, can you give an example of that? Because that's really important for people to, to understand. Is, do you have an example of something like that? Uh, yes. For instance, um, there's, there's layers of things. For instance, someone has um, a skin rash that's very uh, uncomfortable. And you want to address that. But of course, the skin rash is just a reaction and or a, a manifestation of something else. And then uh, when you work with it, um, several things can happen depending on, on what the cause is. And the rash can improve uh, immediately or it, for, it can become worse in the beginning and then gradually subside or some, something else might come up like uh, an allergy or uh, some immune issues which then after everything is balanced everything will, uh, will be balanced and then the, the symptoms and the issues will disappear. So it's important for everyone uh, listening to this to understand that what looks like one particular thing is it's complicated. These things are all connected within the, the confines of the body. 
And I'm not going to say anything negative about allopathic medicine, but let's go back to the idea of, of skin. If you have a skin rash and you treat the rash symptomatically with, let's say, some salve, it may not work because that really wasn't what was causing the rash. Is that correct? Yes, I, I think so. And the skin issues are often such things. Um, unfortunately, um, the tendency nowadays is to try and control the symptoms, but we really need to understand what's going on beneath that, because if we don't, and we, we treat one manifestation of it, like, as you said, the skin rash, that can subside or it can improve for a while, but then it can come back and it can come back worse than it was, or it can disappear and then something else even, yeah, even more severe may appear just to remind, well, not to remind, but to, to signal that something needs balancing. So this is very important is one of the main differences, let's say, uh, between this approach and the uh, and I don't want to use the term medical approach to in any way say that it's negative, but I'm just saying in this approach, you're looking at or I don't want I mean, I'm saying it. I should probably be asking a question. Are you looking at a more connected issue? versus a sing single or singularity, which seems to be the way that the medical community uh, treats. That's the best way I can say it. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It's, it's quite clear what you're asking. Um, I mean, we always need to think of that because um, I think the way things, the, the direction where we're going now is that we'll need to take more responsibility for our health and that implies understanding what the issues mean and where do they come from. And in the case of Reiki, um, you don't need to go a, a lot in depth about what's happening and why, because that might take a long time. But you can address the issue at its root cause by channeling the energy. And then at the same time, you can tell the recipient, okay, this will improve, but keep in mind um, whatever the cause was, and this is also something that needs to be said, most of the physical issues are rooted in on another level. Many of them are emotional. There are some people that say that all disease has emotional causes. I don't think it's only emotional. But it can be mental, it can be spiritual, it can be on other levels. And that's why you need to ask people to ask themselves, what's wrong? Why did this happen? How did this come to be? And try and change their lives and balance their lives. Because if they don't change anything, then this issue will come up again, definitely. It's, it becomes a lesson that needs to be learned. Um, an important part of Reiki are the symbols. And uh, it's good to know that Reiki uses several symbols in order to focus the energy or work with the energy in different ways. And these symbols are used by drawing them in the air. You can also use them by printing them out and placing printed verses in the vicinity of the recipient or uh, under the recipient. Uh, or you can also use them by pure visualization. And the traditional or Usui Reiki uses four symbols. And the first symbol is called the Chokurei, and it is known as the power symbol. Phonetic translations of the uh, Japanese kanji symbols or letters. Uh, but it's the the best uh, possible English translation. It's chokure. It's three um, letters, let's say, which are translated as placing the power of the universe here and now. 
and it is used for cleansing and to switch on the flow of energy. This symbol can be used on, for instance, on the walls, ceiling and the floor of a room in order to prepare the space before a session. And it's also widely used um, before or during the session. Um, the, the arrows that you see here are indications to how you would uh, draw the symbol. So this is drawn in the air, not on yeah. the wall. It's you draw it in the air, and then you visualize the symbol going in on the place that you want it. If you use it on the wall, that you imagine it fusing it with the with the wall. But you first draw it. At least that's the way I do it because I think it's a, a more dynamic and a more powerful way to use the symbol rather than just visualizing it. And so you go from left to right, and then you go down and draw the spiral and you finish the symbol. And also, uh, they say you should call it three times. So then you say either, either out loud or in your mind, chokurei, three times, and then you use it. And that goes for all symbols. It's used for cleansing and in, to switch on the flow of energy. Now, the symbol can be also be drawn reversed, and it's called obviously reversed chokurei symbol, and it's used for activation. So when you say when you say it can be used in reverse, are you saying that you would start where the uh, coils ended and do the whole thing backwards? No, it's um, all right. That's that's good. That's good because that's what I thought. All right. Okay, let me show them again. So this is the regular chokure, and the reverse one is a bit of a mirror of it. So instead of going from left to right, here we go from right to left. Okay, so this is the this is the reverse chokure, and it's uh, almost a mirror image of the regular chokure. So the way you would draw it is you go from right to left, then you go down, and then you go and make the spiral the other way. So the, in this symbol, you go clockwise. In the regular chokure, you go counterclockwise. And this is the symbol that represents protection, as well as mental and emotion, emotional healing. And this can be used on persons, as well as situations and relationships. And this is another interesting aspect of Reiki, because you, uh, you do Reiki on persons, but you can do Reiki on anything. You can do Reiki on a building, you can do Reiki on a relationship, for instance, someone comes and says, you know, I have a very bad relationship with my mother or, or with my wife. I'd like to improve that. And then you can do a session. You don't even need the person. Uh, you can do a session channeling the energy towards the relationship that, that you want to improve. And then uh, this symbol, the Seiheki symbol, would be used usually, along with the others, of course, because this, again, Depends on personal experience and preference, but um, I always use the chokure and a symbol that will come back after this one. Now, this is the symbol uh, that is longer, <laughs> both in writing. These are obviously uh, Japanese letters. Uh, it's pronounced Honsha Zeshonen. And it's also known as the distance Reiki symbol. And as the name says it, it's obviously used in remote and or distance sessions. By preference, it's, you should start with it. And it's translated as without past, present, and future. Um, however, it can also be translated by uh, the divinity in me salutes the divinity in you. And that's a whole different meaning. The, the most used um, meaning is the no time, no space, no past, present, and future. Uh, basically, it 
um, affirms the power of now, but you can use it to either send healing at a distance, or you can use it with time in the sense that you can use it for healing of the ancestral line, the line of ancestors of someone, or you can send energy with it to the future or to the past or to any project that you would like. This is a symbol that transcends time and space. Hmm. Now, another symbol, which is also known as the master symbol, is called in Japanese the Daikomyo symbol, and it translates as great shining light. Now, because it's also a bit complicated, I prefer the Tibetan version of it, which you can see now, which is easier to draw and to use, in my opinion. Um, and what is good to know is it's called the master symbol because it represents the connection with the highest level of guidance that one has access to. And that's why you can use it for all purposes. The other symbols are a bit more specific and pragmatic in use. You use it in certain situations. The Daikomyo symbol you can use at any time for everything. And I will stop with the symbols here because there are many others, uh, depending on the system and the people using it. But the symbols are an important part of Reiki. Uh, now I'll say a few words about the Reiki session, uh, how a session would look like or go, because I imagine that people that don't know about it would like to have an idea of what would a Reiki session look like. And it starts with an intake. Uh, people talk and generally the practitioner asks uh, more information about the reason for the Reiki session or and or the issues that they'd like addressed. And of course, for follow-up, you would like to know how things went before and improvements and impressions and that might change the way that you think of the session currently being done. Um, now in my case, um, I combine modalities as I was saying, I use crystals and that's because I like to have a baseline before the session and that's why I test the chakra system with the crystal pendulum before I start the session, I want to see how the flow of energy in the chakras, in each of the chakras is. And then the session will start. During the session, many people play relaxing music. They may burn some incense or um, dim the lights to, uh, to make the atmosphere easier for people to relax. An average session takes about an hour. And the results are assessed at the end. Um, in my case, I test the energy again after the session to see if there were disbalances before, to see if they were corrected during the session. Um, this um, ceremony was uh, originally done only in person, with the master touching the practitioner or apprentice on the head, shoulders, and hands. And more recently, it, it has been done remotely or by distance attunement. And as a side note, um, I've received all my attunements um, as a distance and or remote attunement. And I define these notions that I've talked about. What is remote? Remote means people synchronizing in time. At the same time, they do it and then they have the uh, assurance that it is being done and received at the same time. But you can also do it um, via distance attunement, which means each in its own time. For example, via chibol. Chibol is, means ball of energy. And um, if you believe it or not, there are people that uh, attune other people at a distance. I've received many attunements and empowerments which is like a smaller attunement. Um, 
from Energy Masters uh, via Chibol. I haven't even met the person. I I know their name now, but uh, you may not even know their name, and they can do it for you. But they say some people uh, say that certain attunements and or empowerments can only be done uh, when the recipient already has is attuned to the master Reiki level, because they need to know a little bit about uh, energy work. You need to be able to receive the energy because they can make the chi ball for you, but if you don't ask for it and or receive it, then nothing will happen. That's it. that's important to know. It's a way of doing things, and I was uh, amazed when I discovered the, the world of uh, distance Reiki. Hmm. Um, I will get to the next um, energy healing modality or energy work, because uh, each of these modalities represents a world in itself, and we can talk hours and hours about each of them, but I'd like to give an overview of a few of them and how I understand to combine them. Uh, I'd like to talk about crystals and gemstones, and um, gemstones and crystals are very dear to my heart because I've been experimenting with them since I was very young, as you've said. Um, I think crystals and gemstones are uh, living beings, and this is something that's been said over and over again. And uh, the beautiful thing about them is that they really come to life, if you like, when they interact with humans. And um, they do say if you take a, if you if you don't pick up a gemstone and or crystal, it will stay. Um, how should I say, in a, in a latent state. But if you pick it up and you cleanse it properly and then you start working with it with the intention, that's when it really comes to life. And um, I was amazed by the experiences that I had with different crystals. Let me ask you a question. Uh, so are you saying uh, the, the, the crystal needs to be picked up by the person who somehow enlivens them or awakens them or yes and you do that with your energy because they might uh, they might look like rocks but they they're much more than that um that's why they say that you should pick your crystals yourself if at all possible they recommend instead of uh, browsing an online folder to go to a shop and okay. really uh, get a feel of the crystals, take it in your hand, look at it, study it in the light, and decide what you feel, the, the crystal that you feel drawn to will probably serve you best. Hmm. That's, a, that's a beautiful picture of those crystals. Uh... Yes, it is. Uh, it's just, I have an idea, because, incidentally, I have many uh, of them at home because I've been collecting them for many years. Um, I think they're all beautiful, and once you get to know them, uh, they, they really, as I was saying, they really come to life, and you can have interactions with them in a way that you wouldn't expect otherwise. Hmm. Uh, I'd like to make the distinction between crystals and gemstones. Yeah, please do. Uh, crystals usually refer to minerals that have a crystalline structure, and they have different geometry depending on the crystal. And gemstones uh, are minerals which can be crystalline or not. So gemstones is the, the larger class, and the crystals are part of the gemstones that have a crystalline structure. Hmm. And I will only say a few words. Uh, there are so many books that have been written and so much information that's been given about crystals uh, that I, I encourage anyone to if they feel inclined to, to do so, because um, you can spend easily a lifetime studying crystals. But I will only talk about uh, the clear quartz, because, uh, as I was saying, there's hundreds, if not thousands of them, to be found on Earth. But clear quartz is the most abundant in the mineral kingdom. It's found everywhere 
on earth. And that's why it's cheapest to buy. And they say that it is the most humble crystal in the tin quotes. And it is not humble at all, actually. It's the most powerful healing crystal. It's also, it's also called the master healer and is the most powerful energy amplifier on the planet because of its unique form. And the, incidentally, the first book that I've read about crystals um, only talked about the clear quartz. It was a thin book and it was difficult to come by for me at the time because of the situation. Uh, I, uh, I got this book when um, things were just changing in Romania after the revolution of 89. So it was only a couple of years after that that this book appeared and I was uh, quick to buy it. And I started to work with a clear quartz because it was only described as such in the book and because it was the only, f only one that I could find at the time. It was a very, very small piece of clear quartz, but I, uh, I was wearing it every day and little by little I started working with it and it made me sensitive to energy. It was the first uh, crystal that I really worked with and I felt the crystal vibrating in my hand. So when people, now, um, can I just interrupt for a second? When, when people sure. wear a, a, a quartz crystal, let's say all of the time then is that more i don't know what the best word is alive or awake than if that same crystal was just sitting on the mantle someplace um that depends i mean wearing it, it is definitely not enough you need to interact with it you need to so, constantly constantly work with it how okay is that a big subject or because if you only wear it and you do nothing, and just like a piece of stone or um, jewelry that you wear, it, it won't um, it, it won't become anything more than that. But you have to have the the constant intention to interact with it, and if you want to do that, there's there's many books that can teach you how. And uh, this, uh, for instance, this book was showing uh, or describing exercises, exercises that you can do with it. Um, you need to hold the crystal in your left hand because that's the receiving hand, that's, that's the hand that connects you best with something. Of course, after you cleanse it, clean it and cleanse it. That's an important point. Again, this is by no means uh, intended as a handbook of how to work with crystals. It's just uh, saying a few words about it. But um, there, there are many things you can do with it. And little by little doing it, working with it with an intention, um, you will get better of, at working with crystals and crystals will open up to you. Um, as I was saying, you can work with it, for instance, uh, just holding the crystal on the place of disease with your hand will promote energetic balance. Hmm. Again, if you know how to work with it. And the only way to get better of it is uh, experimenting. And besides holding, uh, there are many techniques of energy healing that can be performed using crystals. And uh, I will list a few just for to enumerate them. You can do a chakra and or aura scanning with a crystal pendulum. And I uh, like to do this with uh, all the people that come for me for issues as an alternative medicine practitioner for one-on-one -on -one sessions. You can repair leakages and blockages in energy. You can do what is called aura combing which is swiping the aura for low vibrational energy and getting rid of it. You can clear cords and connections from chakras and or from the aura. You can do balancing using laser wands. You can use it for healing amplification. 
And last but not least, you can create essences and elixirs from crystals. Now I will uh, go on to the angels, because there is such a thing as angel therapy. Um, angels are well known through history because they have been mentioned in all major religions and they were depicted in art and uh, archaeology or archaeological findings. But for the purposes of today, we can think of them as multidimensional entities who serve the highest good and welfare of humanity and the planet. And these are the entities that can be worked with. They can be asked for assistance and you can work with them during energy healing sessions. How can you do that? You can ask for the presence of angels when you begin a session. You can actually invite the, the angels in the space where you're working or doing healing even before you start the session. And they will uh, help clear the air and raise the vibrations of the space. And because angels have specific gifts, you can use them as such. For instance, Archangel Sandalfon can help with grounding. And Archangel Michael is called on for protection and he assists with clearing and release of outdated energy. And you have Archangels Raphael and Ariel who help with healing and raising one's vibrations. And you just call them by name and you ask them for assistance and they will, uh, they will help. Uh, working with the angels enhances the effects of uh, any session. When the practitioner refers to them at certain, certain time points as it is appropriate. And some people also ask for guidance and uh, this is referred to as divination when people use oracle cards. Last but not least, I'd like to talk a little bit about frequency therapy. Frequency therapy is applied using devices which generate specific frequencies that can be used for healing and or balancing or support of the different organs and systems of the human body. Frequencies are applied by means of a carrier that can be electrical current, pulsed electromagnetic field, a laser, or a scalar field. Now these devices come with a software, and most of the available programs in the software address physical issues. However, there are frequencies that work with emotions as well as the energy body such as chakras, aura, or meridians. And one thing that frequency therapy can do is that substances such as medication, vitamins, and essential oils can be applied to the body in their frequency equivalent, and this prevents possible side effects. You only get the beneficial effects of medication by using frequency therapy. And uh, now I would like to talk about the connections between the different therapy modalities. I think you can combine each with every one of them. But there are some uh, things that people are already doing. And as a side note, um, I have done courses in crystal reiki in angel therapy, and I got uh, the appropriate attunements for it. So it's not only that people have thought about it, but they have experience with it. And they, this goes as far as attuning other people to the use of crystals with Reiki and uh, calling on angels together with Reiki. And crystal Reiki, for instance, is uh, when you channel the Reiki energy, through crystals, so it goes through the um, practitioner's body and then it goes through the crystals, which are used for energy amplification and enhancement. 
and each of the crystals and or gemstones that you might use uh, brings its own enhancement to the energy and therefore the effect of the session. And you can also use Reiki energy and or symbols in order to cleanse and to program the crystals. And this is an interesting notion because many crystals are programmable, especially, especially the, um, the clear quartz one, for instance. You can program it with frequencies from the frequency therapy devices. You can program it with uh, Reiki, with the symbols and with your intention. And I think the more you do that, then the stronger the effect will be. Yeah. Yes, I think you wanted to ask something. I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> <laughs> okay, shall I go on? Yeah. Goodness, we don't need to hear me. <laughs> okay. Um, now, there's obviously angel Reiki, as I've said, in which you can work with the angels before and during the energy session. You can combine an, uh, angel therapy with sound therapy, and this is an interesting thing because uh, people who work with angels often refer to them as uh, the angels can sing with you. Mm. And um, there's um, there's many ways to do it, but I've uh, I've done it quite often actually during a session when I'm channeling the energy. Is I'm uh, I'm focusing or evoking um, a tune or a song, or sometimes uh, I feel inspired with something. I, I hear a specific song or tune, and then you can work with entities with it, and that's angel therapy. You, you can also combine Reiki with frequency therapy, and, and, and this I've, I really like to do, actually. Uh, you can use Reiki to cleanse and energize the devices, and you can use Reiki to link the DNA and or photograph of the actual person in the case of distance sessions, because you can do distance sessions with the frequency therapy devices. And some people might find this hard to believe, but um, it's already a proven fact, and I'm talking now about the mainstream science, such as physics, uh, in which people have demonstrated that everything is energy, which um, was quite mind-blowing for me. But I remember some years ago reading an editorial article in a prestigious um, scientific research journal. I'm not sure if it was nature or science, but it's one of them, and these are the two most important journals. People have a hard time getting anything published there. And uh, I remember reading an editorial um, that was stating that everything is energy, pure and simple. And I found it very significant because People don't really think of energy that way. But if you do um, accept the fact that everything is energy, then even such devices that you would see as mechanical or electrical are also made up of energy. And then you can work with them the same way as you would work with energy with a person. Um, just a few ideas uh, to take as maybe as take home messages. Um, I believe that our planet is now undergoing a rapid increase in global frequency or vibrations, if you refer, if you prefer the term. And because of that, there are ample opportunities for personal as well as collective spiritual evolution. As part of this process, Many energy healing modalities are emerging, which are likely to become part of medicine in the future, and that's my opinion. Combining these modalities and integrating them in a higher perspective of human health will enable and accelerate this process. Uh, 
Okay, so this was my presentation. I, uh, I've gone through a few uh, points about how I think about alternative medicine and what people can do with it and how different modalities can be combined. And um, I hope I'm allowed to do that, but I also gave some information on the practice that we have. Uh, we have a website there, and if anyone would feel interested to address me any questions, I also added my email address. Um, but I'm really glad I did it because uh, this is the first time that I'm compiling such a combination of notions and things that I've learned. And it was very useful and beneficial for me in the sense that it also um, helped me to clarify some points for myself. No matter what you think you know about your profession, as soon as you start to teach it, you learn so much that you didn't re realize you didn't know when you start to teach. Um, so I always recommend teaching to everybody. Uh, it's how I learned uh, my music. My music career was based on the fact that I taught kids <laughs> when I was when I was well, I was a kid myself. I was only in my uh, uh, late teens, but I was teaching you know kids how to learn how to play piano, and that's how I learned how to play piano. I mean, I thought I knew how to play until I had students <laughs> started to pass me by. I had to. I'm asking I, questions. I had to I had to start studying again, which which was a great way to to learn my uh, my career. It was great. Yeah, I yeah. enjoyed it a lot for the same reason. I mean, I, I really like to share information, but I also uh, like because usually you're teaching to young minds, and they always come with questions that are some of them are very predictable and easy to answer, but some of them are really challenging. And then it um, well by trying to give a good answer and explaining those points, then also there are many things that become clear to you, or maybe some things you do realize that you need to go even more in depth on. Absolutely. Well, um, Livia, thank you so much for being part of Timeless Voyager. Um, I, I'm just very appreciative of, of this program that, that you did today. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to have done it. And I'm always happy to enjoy our conversation. All right. Uh, for the rest of you, I want to say thank you for watching and listening to the Timeless Voyager series. The podcast, of course, is on video players like YouTube, and audio players like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, Amazon, and many, many more. Uh, one thing that you can do to support the growth of the Timeless Voyager series is to hit that like button, share, comment, and please subscribe. Uh, my next milestone is 1,000 subscribers. You can help by just hitting that subscribe button. It's, it's actually below in the description uh, and probably other places that I might have missed. But it triggers algorithms that help grow the Timeless Voyager channel. So uh, remember, subscribing is free and it's easy to do. My name is Bruce Stephen Holmes. I hope that your own personal voyage through life towards the development of your highest potential is a joyous, and successful one.